we're going to talk about something uh, that might seem a little bit surprising. And the title of the message is, Here's How You Kill Unity. The first way, you will absolutely kill unity in the family of God. Cultivate a critical spirit. People with a critical spirit think they have a strong gift of discernment when all they really have is a harsh curse of judgment. Criticism is not how God talks. This is good news. Because if criticism were the way God talked, it wouldn't just be the way he talked about everybody else. It would also be the way he talked about you. You talk the most like the one you listen the most to. Second way to absolutely certifiably kill unity in the family of God, to nurture the spirit of offense. An offense is an event, but being offended is a decision. Matthew 5, 44, Jesus says, but I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. It is easy to be critical when you compare yourself to the one who is in sin. It is impossible to criticize when you compare yourself to the one who never sinned. The third way to kill unity in the family of God, tolerate a lack of forgiveness. One of the best parts of forgiving is forgetting. Because if I can't forget it, I'll just have to keep reliving it. Even when you've been hurt and you have a reason to stick it to them, you open your hands, you turn towards God, you beg God to bless them. Well, good morning. How is everybody? You look good. I want to say welcome to everybody joining us online. If you've got a Bible, I want you to open up to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We're going to wrap up our series today on division and unity. That's what we've spent the last couple of months focused on. And the title of the series is A House Undivided. And last week we talked about how to kill unity. And I kind of asked the setup question at the beginning of the message. How many of us wake up every day with the goal, I, I want to kill unity in the family of God. And nobody, thankfully, raised their hand in any of the services, at least that I saw. But it's one thing not to raise your hand. It's another thing to actually walk it out. And one of the ways we know that we don't want to kill unity is we're dead set on killing division. And that's what we're talking about today. The title of this message is, Here's How You Kill Division. Last week was, Here's How You Kill Unity. This week, Here's How You Kill Division. And we're going to spend some time looking at the first century church. Because to me, one of the best pictures of unity and a lack of consistent division is the first century church. And here's why. The beginning of the church was the season of its greatest innocence. And so it's wisdom to take notes on what it was they did and were known for. Let's read together Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals and also to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place, speaking of the temple, and shared everything they had. Now that's revival right there. You got a bunch of humans to share everything they have. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Now, I'm going to give you three things. This is, as always, not an exhaustive list, but three of the biggest things that I think were essential to the unity of the first century church. And I want you just to take a look at your own life, and on a scale of 1 to 10, where, where would you rate yourself? So let's take this journey together. Here's point number one. The first way to kill division. 
Point number one, agreement. Agreement. Division develops when you dabble in disagreement. This episode of Sesame Street is brought to you by the letter D. I'll read to you again, Acts 2.42. What did they agree on? In order to have agreement, you got to agree on some stuff, right? Well, what did they agree upon? Acts 2.42, all the believers devoted themselves. Their agreement was based on what they were devoted to, not just what they were passionate about. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. My wife, Holly, and I disagree on a lot. Some of you think that the person who sits in this seat or stands on this platform never has disagreements with their spouse. She's not perfect, so of course we're going to disagree. <laughs> She's not in this service, so I talk a big game. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know I'm not saying that in the next service. <laughs> I want to stay married. We, we do disagree in a lot, though. Uh, it, it's just part of human relationship, right? And one of the things I've learned, now we, we have what we call date day. It's usually Friday in, in our house. That's the goal. And one of the things I've learned about having a great date day and date night is never start the date talking about what you disagree on. I used to make this mistake back in the day. And then date night never ended the way I wanted it to because she was still too focused on what we disagree on. So, for instance, back in the day, I mean, we've been, we're about to celebrate 20 years here in January. Back in the day, we'd start off date night with, well, what sounds good? Where do you want to go for dinner? And she would say, well, I want to go here. And I would say, no, that does not sound good to me. 20 years later, now when she says, this restaurant sounds good to me, here's my response. Oh, my word. I can't even believe this. That is the exact place I wanted to go more than any other place in the history of humanity. How did you? We were meant to be together. <laughs> Incidentally, one of the reasons why I like disagreement is because agreeing after you disagree is awesome. But don't disagree just to disagree. Fight for agreement. Here's what I would say. Fellowship is broken when agreement isn't fought for. We have to fight for agreement. It doesn't just naturally happen. One of the ways we fight for agreement is we prioritize what God has asked us to be devoted to. Not just what opinion we're most passionate about. Now, Listen to the way the early disciples talked. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. Okay, so for anybody thinking, oh, Preston, you just want me to agree with everyone even if they don't believe what I believe. No, no, no. No, the disciples establish. In order to have fellowship with one another in the kingdom, like we have to agree on the essentials. So they're pointing to the gospel. They're saying, hey, what we have taught you, we, this is what we saw, and this is what we heard. We got this directly from the source so that we can have fellowship. In other words, if you don't agree on this, we can't have fellowship. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the Greek word for fellowship is the word koinonia. Some of you may have heard this word. But it, it doesn't just mean fellowship. Here's one of the strongest definitions of the word koinonia to hold on to something common in a strong way. To fight for it, to hold on to it together. It's not just the fellowship hall. I don't know what, what denomination, if you grew up in church, but our church had a fellowship hall, okay? 
We're not talking about that kind of fellowship. We're talking about a committed brand of fellowship, holding on to something in common tightly together. If the devil can get you focused on areas of disagreement, he never has to worry about the power of your agreement. I want to show you why agreement is so important in the family of God. I also want you to see this is exactly why the devil is trying to divide God's family. Simply because of the power that comes with agreement. Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 19, listen to the words of Jesus. He says, I also tell you this, if two of you agree, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Do we actually believe that? Because I think if we did, two of us would spend a lot more time praying together than we presently do. This is the power of agreement. For where two or three gather together as my followers, Jesus says, I am there among them. What a promise. This is pointing us to corporate prayer. Now, some of us might think corporate prayer is, is only when we gather as the, the complete church, capital C. No, no, no. Here, here's what corporate prayer is. Anytime you pray with somebody else, not just by yourself, that's corporate prayer. And one of the beautiful things about corporate prayer is it puts God at the center of human relationship. Ecclesiastes chapter four, every time I do a wedding, I always use Ecclesiastes chapter four. A cord of three strands cannot be easily broken. That's not just talking about marriage. It's talking about human relationship. Anytime God is a part of relationship, it's difficult for the devil to tear it apart. And prayer together is one of the ways we strengthen that bond. Here's one of the things I've learned about praying with other family members of the Lord's. That when we pray together, our relationship always gets stronger. Incidentally, this is one of the reasons I've taught for at least 15 years to young adults. If you're not married yet, I don't think it's wise to pray together. Because prayer is a lot more powerful than you think. Something special happens when we pray together. And so I just, I, I, for the young adults who are dating right now, I just, I'd ask you to pray about it alone. Just ask the Lord, because prayer is one of the most powerfully intimate things God has given us, and you need to be really careful who you bring into that conversation and when they come into that conversation. I want you just to, to think about what Jesus says in Matthew 18 and how powerful praying together is. Let me just paint a picture. This is a hypothetical so don't, don't nail your theology to it, but I just, I, I wanna present a what if, okay? Based on Matthew chapter 18. I want you to imagine one day that God just leaves heaven quickly to come down to earth. And there's a young angel that's shocked and says to an older angel, what's happening right now? What's going on? Where's he going? And the older angel says, shh, two on earth are gathered together in his name to pray. Shh, let's listen to what they say. Can you even imagine if, if, if God behaves like that every time you pray with your spouse? If he looks around heaven and says, hush, 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 everyone be quiet. I'll be right back. I promise them. Every time they do that thing together, I'll be there with them. And they will see my response. This is the power of our agreement. So of course the devil would try to divide we will never pray with one another when we don't agree with one another. That's why the devil's trying to get 
all of us just fighting with each other. It really stems back to the power of agreement in prayer. Here's the second thing, commitment. Commitment. The second thing that kills the spirit of division is commitment. Our culture is known for cancellation. It's become a, a buzzword now, cancel culture. That's what our culture is known for, cancellation. Therefore, the church must be known for the opposite, commitment. Cancellation is the exact opposite of commitment. So if our culture is known for cancellation, the church, capital C, must be known for commitment. Let me say it another way. This is one of my favorite one-liners of this message. Culture loves to cancel relationship because of mistakes. Jesus came to cancel mistakes because of relationship. That's nasty. Let me say it again. Culture loves to cancel relationship because of mistakes. But Jesus came to cancel mistakes because of relationship. The church must be known for the opposite. If everybody's canceling everybody with a lack of grace, then we must be known as a people of grace. Strong in the area of commitment. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be devoted. There's that word again. Be devoted to what? To one another in brotherly love. And let me show you what commitment looks like and how Christian commitment talks in the body of Christ. This is how seriously the early disciples took being committed to one another. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. Listen to the way they, they talk. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Why? Because you had become very dear to us. Okay, here's a really tough question. When was the last time you talk like that about the person sitting in the row behind you. I hear all the time, oh, I met so-and-so during meet and greet. That's great. That's great. I'm glad you met them. But meeting is only the beginning of commitment. This is how the early disciples talked to one another, not just the apostles. This is how they talked. We, we're not just sharing the gospel with you. We're sharing our lives with you and understand why. Because you have become unbelievably dear to us. Now, the big question, what were the early disciples of Jesus Christ most committed to relationally? Let me give you two things. If you're taking notes, write both of these down. Here's the first one. They were committed to worshiping together in his house in person. Now, let me say just for a minute, for those of you joining us online, please hear my heart. I'm not trying to step on your toes. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm just telling you what God says in his word. Now, some of you joining us online, you're doing so because you, you fall into an at-risk category. And I totally understand. I, I hear from multiple people in that, that bracket every week, and they miss us, and we miss you. And, and I don't want you to feel anything. But I'm also smart enough to know that there are still many who are staying at home just because they want to, and they can. So I'm not trying to come at you, I promise. And this is not political. Please hear my heart and hear God's word. This is not political, it's spiritual. Acts chapter two, verse 44, and all the believers met together in one place. Where was that one place? The temple. And they shared everything they had. Think about this. God's favorite place to be is wherever you are. But God's favorite place for you to be is wherever he is. 
Oh, I love my job. That is, I, I'm telling you, when he dropped that one on me this week, I, I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off in my office. That is so theologically nasty that it might take me the rest of my life to figure out. God's favorite place to be is wherever you are. But God's favorite place for you to be is wherever he is. Let's go back to the, the date night picture. I, I'll help you understand how I personally see weekend worship in the house of the Lord. I see it like date day. Here's why. Because it's when the bride and the bridegroom come together in God's house. Implication scripturally is on the Sabbath, the day set apart by God for God, this is date day in the Christian faith. And I want you just to imagine for a minute, remember the church is the bride. And who is the bridegroom? Jesus, right? That's what the Bible says. I want you just to imagine every Sunday. Now, Stats said before COVID started that the average Christian attended church in person less than 1.5 times per month. Imagine how much lower that number is post-COVID. I know we're still dealing with it, but we're in a different phase of it. I mean, imagine what it's like now. And let's just go to the, stick with the date day picture. Let's just imagine every weekend. Date day comes, and you, the bride, says to the bridegroom, you know what I want to do for date day? I just want to stay here at my house. I, I'll, I'll join online. I, I'm just going to watch, but I'd like to stay here. And I want you to imagine that going on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then one day, the bridegroom finally says to the bride, hey, uh, I've noticed something about date day. We always seem to do what you want to do. And we always seem to go where you want to go. Would it be okay if this week on date day, we did what I wanted to do? Now, I know you well enough to know, most likely you'd respond something like this. Oh, Jesus, I didn't know you wanted to do, I just thought you wanted to be where I was. You want to do something? You want to go somewhere? You just tell me. I'm in. We're going. And I think if you responded that way to the bridegroom, Jesus, here's what I think he would say in response. When you said, Jesus, where would you like to go for date day? Here's what I think he would say, and I'd bet everything to my name on it. I'd like to go to my father's house today. And I'd like you to go with me. That's how I want to spend date day with my bride in my father's house. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. I think God put that in for you. Just to go, nope, that's everybody else. Let us not neglect our meeting together in the house of God as some people do. Now watch this next part, but encourage one another especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. What does that mean? The closer we get to Christ's return, the more important it is for the family of God to worship together weekly in the house of God. Again, speaking to everybody watching online right now, you might be feeling conviction. I don't want you to feel condemnation. I'm not coming at you. I'm simply asking you to pray. What's the Holy Spirit saying? Hebrews chapter 10, the closer we get to the return of Christ, the more important it is for the family of God to gather together in the house of God. It's interesting to note that the context of Hebrews chapter 10 is not on what a believer gets from the assembly, but rather on what the believer can contribute to the assembly. That's the context here. Let me say it this way. Commitment to the house of the Lord is based on contribution, not consumption. Now, I'm going to close my eyes, online crowd, when I say this next one. Okay? Remember, 
I'm at my best when I just write down and repeat what I feel like he's saying. So I'm submitting this. Please, I'm thankful you're not here because you can't hit me. All right? Let me just close my eyes when I, when I say this one. I'll just look away from you. With online church, you can consume, but you can't contribute. I've gone back and forth for months, and the elders know this. If it were up to me, I would pull the plug on our online streaming. It goes against everything in the church planner's handbook. And I know there, there are families that travel, and it's wonderful that they want to stay connected. But I get concerned that I'm making it easy for the enemy to do his job. Amen. Preston, I can hear maybe one or two saying online, I've been contributing this whole time during COVID. I know I haven't been in attendance but I have been contributing. I've been giving every two weeks since COVID started. I have been contributing. And, and let me just say to those of you watching online who might say that, I love it. I love that you're so passionate to return to the Lord what he said was his, the tithe. I love it. I love it that you're so passionate about giving sacrificial gifts to him. It's incredible, but I'm gonna say something to you I don't think I've ever said to our church before. If in your mind it's one or the other, contribution from afar with pennies or contribution from within with your presence, I wanna tell you something I've never told you before. If you're asking me to choose between your pennies and your presence, I'll see you next week. That's not some slogan. I hope you know that. And here's why, and this is kind of strong. If you're wondering, what, Preston, why, why can you take that stand? I'll, I'll tell you why and you'll completely understand. What do you call a dad who sends money every month but never comes home? Those of you watching online, if you're doing so just because it's gotten convenient and it's not because your health is at risk, can I just tell you, we wanna see you again. The body of Christ needs you. Here's the second thing they were committed to. They were committed to being together in your home, not just in his house. Committed relationship cannot exist without consistent conversation. It's one of the reasons we have meet and greet the way that we do every week. We're trying to foster consistent conversation. You can't have committed relationship without it. Acts 2.46, they worship together at the temple each day. Now we're talking about just getting into church once a week. When they first started, they were in the house every day. We should all feel like we're getting off easy four times a month. They were going more than that every week. They worshiped together at the temple each day, but that's not all they did. They met in homes, their homes, for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Some of my favorite moments in this church over the last eight years have not happened in his house. They've happened in yours. Some of the most amazing stories have come through moments in our groups, in your homes. See, marriages aren't just saved in his house. They can also be saved at yours. This is what the first century church was built around. 
Worship in God's house, worship together, fellowship together in your house. And here's what you need to remember. If all we do is fellowship together on Sunday or now on Thursday as well, that's merely formality. But here's what you have to remember about the healthiest families. The healthiest and strongest families have fun outside of the formal. There's some amazing people in this church. But you're never going to know that if the only time you give yourself, the only chance you give yourself to meet them is for 90 seconds every weekend during meet and greet. This is what the early church was built around. Relationship with God, relationship with his family. And then here's the third thing that I believe will absolutely kill a spirit of division. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. The evidence of commitment is sacrifice. In all the the marriage counseling I've done over the last 20 years, I hear it all the time. I, I love my spouse. Okay, well, prove it to me. Well, I tell her all the time. That's awesome. I write love notes to her. That's romantic. But I always ask a question, but how have you sacrificed for her? And here's the loaded question. What has this marriage cost you to be in it? And if their list is short, this is strong, their commitment is weak. The same exists in the church. If I don't sacrifice, for the bride. I can't really make the statement that my commitment level is strong to her. Cars run on gas, but love runs on sacrifice. Acts 2.45, they sold, the church sold their property and possessions as all the Californians moved in. because they were smart like that. I'm selling my house. People would be going crazy. I'm like, well, I don't want to sell my house, but if, if these Californians keep coming in, I'm like, hey, hey bring your real estate numbers with you. <laughs> they sold their property and possessions, and they shared the money with those in need. Here's what you need to, need to remember about the why behind this. Those who share in God will inevitably share his nature. For God so loved the world that he, he what? He gave. What did he give? The most valuable thing he could. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than to lay his life down, to sacrifice his own life for his friend. Listen, this kingdom always has and always will run on sacrifice. Until the return of Jesus Christ. Because that's what love runs on. Sacrifice. Listen to Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, what Jesus says. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. I get asked every once in a while, Why, Preston, why do you think God instituted tithing? Well, I'm not God, so I can't fully and accurately answer that, but I can give you my my thoughts and my opinion. Why would God create tithing? I think Matthew chapter 6 tells us. Not because the church desperately needs it. Here's why I think God did it. To help ensure that his children's hearts were always in his house. See, here's what the the devil has gotten people convinced about. That tithing is about your money. I, I I can blow a bullet in that one in three seconds with God's word. The tithe isn't yours. It's not mine. 
God said, the tithe belongs to me. It's holy. It's set apart to me. So that the enemy would try and convince us all that tithing is about our money. It's not my money. That first tenth doesn't belong to me. We're pressing the church must be hurting. That's why you're talking about this. No, <laughs> it's not. Because this isn't about money. It's about our heart. Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I don't know if you're like me. Aren't you glad the tithe doesn't mean a third? <laughs> like, yeah, it's okay to laugh about that, okay? People are like, I don't want to seem stingy. Lighten out, okay? The tithe, my, my responding to returning God's tithe to him is not about money. It's about my heart. Koinonia has a variant, which just means another word that's closely associated, and it's the Greek word koinonikos, and it means generous, specifically sacrificially generous. So here's how you can sum up this entire message. It's with the word koinonia and koinonikos. Generous, sacrificial fellowship in the house of the Lord with the family of God. Generous, sacrificial fellowship. In other words, relationship that all costs us something. Generous, sacrificial fellowship in the house of God with the family of God. This is how the first century church kicked Satan in his teeth. And remember, what the Bible says was God's response to this behavior. The Bible says God added to their number those who were being saved every day. I believe if we'll behave as they did, we will see the same response they did. One of my greatest prayers in regards to our church is, oh God, one day may you be able to say the same thing of us. God looked at the first century church and their behavior with one another, and you know what he said? More people need to be a part of that family. And so he added to their family those who were being saved every day. It was said of them, my prayer is, it will also be said of us. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I know there are a couple of moments in this message that were strong and I tried to do my best not to get too strong in my tone because this is not between you and me. This is between you and God. And a big part of my job is getting out of God's way. And as it relates to the bride, his church, in this moment, I want you just to search your heart. And alongside of the Holy Spirit, answer this question. Where am I in regards to his bride? Maybe you've seen her the wrong way. Maybe you've been more of a consumer than a contributor for years. Maybe 
you've been unfaithful to her. Here and there and everywhere. One of the things I felt like the Lord said about this moment as we were coming into it earlier this week, it's pressing, there's going to be an atmosphere of repentance. And let me give you the most simple way to see repentance. It's not just to confess and turn in the opposite direction. Let me give you the relational way to see repentance. Repentance is what happens when something is not right relationally. So we're not just talking about your relationship to the bride. We're talking about your personal relationship to the king. I just want to give a moment before we take communion together. In the same way in my relationship with my wife, when something's not right, the healthier your relationship, the quicker you are to address it and change it. So you may feel like you don't have the best relationship with the Lord right now. Want to know the fastest way to get things back on track? If something's not right between the two of you, here's your chance. Make it right. Confess it to him. And then repent. Turn and move in the opposite direction from here on out. Let's just take a moment and let's do what needs to be done because God deserves it. Let's make things right.
you to want you to reach for the communion elements that you have near you near you and those of you watching online if you are doing communion with us you can go ahead and grab the elements and once you pull out the bread just hold on to it I ask you just to close your eyes again It's mealtime on date day. And the God of the universe has pulled up a seat at your table to sit alone with you. On the night of the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread. said as though we were looking directly at you into your eyes because he wasn't just speaking to the disciples in the room he was speaking to everyone who would come after them Jesus took the bread and he looked at you and he said this is my body which is broken for you but Jesus, aren't you just listening to what I confessed? Didn't you hear that list? Why on earth would you talk like that to me after that? I wonder if Jesus wouldn't just say, oh, sweetheart. I knew all that before you even did it. And before I even went to the cross to do that, I knew. And yet, I still did. This is my body, which is broken for you. Every time you eat of this bread, Jesus says, would you do me a favor? Just remember me. As you take this bread into your mouth, don't make this merely a matter of digestion. Make it a matter of connection. This is his body, which he willingly allowed to be broken for you. Let's take the bread. In the same way, that night Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood. Every drop of it is shed for you. Jesus, you got to be kidding me. Do you not remember the list that I just rolled out to you? I'm ashamed just to speak of such things. Do you not remember what I just said? I just wonder if Jesus wouldn't look you in the eyes and say, I'm going to lean on some words I heard my father speak once. Oh, I heard your list. But I remember them no more. I haven't forgotten your list. I've just chosen not to remember it. Jesus, how is that even possible? Because huh. I've drenched your list in my blood. This is my blood, which is willingly shed for you. And every time you drink from this cup and this ask, 
please just remember me. As you take this cup and drink its content, let the blood wash over the list all over again. Let's take the cup. You can just set your cups down here in this room. With every head bowed, every eye closed, there's one more group of people I want to speak to in this moment. If you're here today and you'd say, I got to know Jesus. I had no idea that's how God talked. I had no idea that if I told him all the things I'm most ashamed of in my life, all the things I've done wrong, I had no idea that's how Jesus would talk in response. I have got to know Jesus right here, right now. With every head bowed, every eye closed, just put your hand up. I've got to know Jesus. I've got to know him. No matter where you're at, Starbucks, your apartment, your house, I've got to know Jesus today. Anybody else? Okay, if you raise your hand, every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you to simply repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I wanna know you. I want to be loved by you. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you came to die for my sins. Jesus, I confess my sin to you. Can you please do something about it? Jesus, I believe you were raised from the dead so that I could be too. Jesus, take my life. Take all of me. I want to spend forever with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I want to ask you to do something, whether you're in this room or you're watching online. Would you just text the name Jesus to the number 24587? Somebody's going to reach out to you. You just gave your life to Christ. We just want to come alongside you, help you in whatever way we can, all right? If you don't have a Bible, we'll send you one, all right? And the next steps are really important as you build this relationship, this personal relationship with Jesus. Not only am I proud of you, all of heaven is celebrating you right now. Let me pray a blessing and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of your family. May we never take it lightly. May we understand our responsibilities as your sons and daughters. May we fall more in love with the bride than ever before. Just as Jesus did, may we lay our lives down for her. May you see generous, sacrificial fellowship in the house of God, among the family of God, here in this place. And may we see your response to such behavior in Christ's mighty name. Amen.